and welcome on stage Chris Anderson, COO and Head of Product at Kit Hiok. Hello. I get to make the, uh, I'm the only thing between you and drinks joke. Thank you, the, the cue up on that. Um, so um, actually I'm CTO of, uh, of uh, uh, Kitty Hawk, but um, that is not as impressive uh, now that uh, we've actually just closed the company. So uh, <laughs> we are, uh, we're a Larry Page um, effort, and those of you who are in Silicon Valley know that getting shut down by Larry Page is kind of a rite of passage. We all have to do it several times. This is my first, well, well there will probably be more. Um, these, are, uh, these are the various things that we've made over the years. Um, you know, things, uh, you know, single person ultralights, um, things that transition, things that have tilt rotors, um, you know, largely create a lot of the, e it's called eVTOL, um, electric vertical takeoff and landing industry, and um, just up the street in Palo Alto, and um, it is a, it's like a right out of a Pixar film. It's uh, an incredible laboratory of cool stuff, and Yes, we shut, them down, shut down the projects every, every few years and we keep starting up new projects. So um, what I'm gonna talk to you about a little bit uh, today is, um, is how we use machine learning in them. Um, so uh, well, we didn't for many years. Uh, for many years, the notion was that there would be a pilot, it'd be relatively traditional. The reason it had to be relatively traditional is that aircraft have to be certified by the FAA to be allowed to fly and the FAA doesn't like machine learning for reasons I'll talk about in a moment, but basically they don't like novelty. They like things that have flown before. And, and so, and you know, that's, that, that, that tends to, tend to steer the industry back to conventional aerospace thinking. Meanwhile, Larry Page, and you know, as you might imagine, comes from the internet generation, you know, Google, Google data centers, and you know, wants to truly transform. So the question is, how do we bring machine learning into the process in a way that is both innovative and also safe. And um, so we start with the edge, um, as, as, you know, as very appropriate uh, for here. So these are, these are some of the ways. Um, so when you have an autonomous aircraft that is like an air taxi, um, the traditional way of thinking about this is that there's a pilot and it takes off at a vertiport, which is like a heliport, and it flies to another vertiport. And you know, so how do you get from point A to point B? And the answer is, is what they call multimodal. You have to sort of drive to the vertiport Vert airplane to vertiport, and then drive from the vertiport to where you want to go. And it's like not necessarily faster and not necessarily cheaper. And uh, so our notion was, well, this should just land in, you know, where you are. It should be like Lyft or Uber in the air. And um, we should land anywhere. You know, it's about the size of an SUV. And it should land anywhere an SUV should go. So how do you do that? Um, and the answer is that um, our sister company, Waymo, the uh, self-driving car company, has the same problem. How do you pick up and drop off people in a random area? And the answer is you pre-survey the area to find area, you know, places that are likely to be a good place to pick up and drop off. And then as you approach that area, you have to confirm that it is still you know, a clear place, that no one's double parked, or there isn't a baby carriage, or something like that. We have to do the same thing in the air. And so what we do is we pre-survey the sites as having likely clear, it's a park here or it's a parking lot there. And then, but as we get close, we have to confirm that it's still clear. And what's worse is that with um, eVTOL aircraft, there's this helicopter phase and then an airplane phase and then a helicopter phase. And then the helicopter phase, it uses a huge amount of energy. These are all electric powered and energy is really the thing we have in short supply. And in the airplane phase, it's very efficient. And so what you want is you want to stay on the wing as long as possible before you commit to a hover. So basically we want to be able to, as we're approaching the green zone, we need, want to be able to kind of discern as we're going very fast at like a thousand feet, you know, it's a sign of probability to the site actually being clear. And that probability increases, we get closer and closer until at some point the probability is high enough that we can commit to the hover. And then we have to keep looking as we come down to make sure that it really is clear. Um, so obviously the way we did this was machine learning. We, um, this was trained on mostly synthetic data, which is like a lot of video game data. Um, and you know, increasingly we brought in real world uh, data and um, it was running on a Raspberry Pi. So there you have it. Um, it's using a Luxonix um, camera. It's a monocular camera with a global shutter. Um, it's got a smart chip. It's got a Myriad X chip in it. So that's doing some of the work, but you know, basically Raspberry Pi 4, which is pretty cool um, that you can do that. And um, it worked, it works great. So we obviously tried it at a large volume and sort of drone size and um, 
had we not been uh, shut down last week, we would have been trying it full size relatively soon, but we'll get back to that and we'll start doing it. So that's one way we use ma machine learning. And um, obviously we need to train with more data sets and we need to bring things like stereo cameras so we can have depth and we need to start integrating multimodal like, like uh, LIDAR and radar into it as well. And that's all part of our machine learning pipeline. Another way we're doing is that, um, remember we have no pilot. Um, I know this sounds crazy, but if you go to San Francisco right now and get a taxi after like I think 10 o'clock, you can get a cruise or a Waymo taxi, which is completely driverless. You get in the back of the car and it just takes you from point A to point B. So that's a thing. Um, we want to do the same thing with air taxis. So you basically pull out your app, you say, you say I want to go to you know, Half Moon Bay or whatever, and then you know, five minutes later, this airplane kind of comes out of the sky, lands in front of you, you get in, there's no pilot, it's just you in a seat. It takes off and takes you to Half Moon Bay and you get out. Um, so what this means is we don't have traditional stuff like we can't file flight plans and we don't have air traffic control, et cetera. We basically have to take all the objective functions that determine how you, you know, how you fly from point A to point B and compress them all into a topology. So these, they, are, they start with things like shortest distance. Then we have to consider things like wind, uh, regulatory constraints about different classes of airspace, other vehicles, which is called deconfliction. Um, we have to consider passenger comfort. We have to consider noise. Some, some localities may not want noise overhead. Um, we have to consider, um, uh, you know, where you're going next, um, you know, where, when you might have to recharge. And all these factors we reduce into topologies. We basically sort of assign them all. We sort of consider them like contours on a map. We assign them all different weights. We then compress them all into one big topology, and then we just gradient descent our way through it. This is, um, in robotics, this is called path planning or motion planning. The difference between path planning and motion planning, by the way, is that path planning is basically going, you know, here's the path I'm going to follow. Motion planning also has to take into consideration the physical limits of the vehicle, like our turn radius. If we're in airplane mode, we can't just turn on a dime. We have to sort of go around in a big circle. We might have um, certain... Um, uh, structural um, limits to, uh, to the vehicle. There could be you know, wind and weather constraints um, as well. In airplane mode, we have a big turning race, radius. In helicopter mode, we have a very tight turning radius. We can just sort of basically literally hover in, in place. So all those things turn into a very complex uh, path, and the way to do it is standard old you know, gradient descent. Um, but unlike traditional robotics, where you might do that, but you would do it before you left, and you would then have a path, and you would execute the path. We, knew, we need to do it in real time. And so basically, the environment is a state, the aircraft is a state, and the environment is constantly streaming functions at us. And we reduce those functions into a topology, we then differentiate, get a gradient, and we basically just follow this gradient as it changes from point A to point B. This has like never been done before. This is exactly what a robot would do, but it's never been done in aerospace before. And the FAA has no idea what to make of it. Um, another thing we do is um, as we tune it, um, as, we, as we create the controls for the vehicle, um, you know, the way you would, let's say you're flying, a, a, you're a, a pilot flying an airplane, you would, you would you'd get to the airplane, you try, you know, wiggle the wings a little left and right, nose front and back, et cetera, and kind of get a feel for it, the moments, the inertia. You know, how does it, how does it feel? And um, the good thing is the software can do the same thing. And so this is basically um, a sort of a gradient descent as well, where the, the aircraft takes off and then does these sort of wiggle, 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 wiggle things. And as it starts to feel, okay, I, I commanded this, this thrust and I got this movement. Okay, so I need to command more thrust to get that movement. And then the difference between the demanded and achieved is once that, once that blue line, which is the, the P term in a PID controller uh, for the nerds, and once that blue line gets to the top, you know that it's like tuned. And then you do that for all your other functions, um, including navigation and everything else. And so it, it teaches itself how to fly, which is pretty cool. Um, but the problem is that the FAA has banned all of this. Uh, so they banned it because the FAA um, uh, is primarily concerned about safety, and what they want to know is that the aircraft is deterministic, which is to say we, we can predict what it will do. And, um, and uh, they, they, they accommodate the notion of a non-deterministic function. That non-deterministic function is called a human being. A pilot is non-deterministic. And you know, a pilot can crash into a mountain if they so choose, but the airplane should not do that on its own. 
You should have absolute predictability about what the airplane will do. So why, so the problem with machine learning is that from their perspective, it's a black box. It's non-deterministic, it's probabilistic, it's stochastic. And the FAA is like, we have no idea how to qualify that. How do you prove to us that it'll work? And, um, and we don't have a good, there's, only, there's, there's basically two answers to this. The first answer is that, okay, fine. We're gonna keep the machine learning out there in kind of the pilot side. So think about the airplane. The airplane has to, you know, the first job of the airplane is to like fly. And the second job of the airplane is to get from point A to point B. So the, the flying part, don't fall out of the sky, that's deterministic. And the fly from point A to point B is basically what a pilot does and that's probabilistic. So we differ, we stick the machine learning stuff all out and kind of, we take the pilot out of the seat, we put machine learning, machine learning in the seat and it sort of resembles a model that the FA is pretty familiar with. Um, they're like, okay, that'll, that'll work. However, you've got to make sure that when the machine learning says something stupid, that the deterministic side doesn't do it. And so you have to have what's called this, this runtime assurance leader, a super hardened interface between the machine learning side and the classic control theory side that will, um, that will sort of block bad stuff. The problem is, and for those of you who have ever gotten into this, is that, is that any interface that's smart enough to know what is, what is sort of you know, crazy is, has to be basically as smart as the, fun, as the machine learning function itself. So let's say that the machine learning function is saying, hey, you know, fly into that mountain. Well, the interface needs to know the mountain exists, right? So now the interface has to have like a sense of topology. And let's say that it's not a mountain, but now it's like, now there's like a, a construction crane that is just wasn't there yesterday, but it's there today. Machine learning algorithm doesn't know about it, says fly there. The interface needs to be at least as smart as the machine learning algorithm. And so now you have this weird sort of metaphysical problem where your, where your sort of policing function has to be smarter than your, than your actor function, if you will, which means that maybe it's a machine learning function itself, which means it's not deterministic and then, and then the FA is ahead just <laughs> So we have not figured out how to solve this. Um, so the good news is that, is that um, uh, everybody understands that aviation is held back by this. And um, autonomous cars have machine learning functions, why shouldn't aircraft, you know, we have to solve this. And so there's a uh, proposal, um, not a proposal, there's a commitment by the FAA to do what's called performance-based certification. So the old certification was every component has to be proven deterministic, it has to work, and you stick a bunch of certified components together and you get a certified system. The performance-based model is like, you know, we're not gonna look under the hood. It is what it is. If you can show us that it can fly a million hours without an accident, that's good enough for us. So all we need to do is fly a million hours without an accident and we're there. Um, so aside from the fact that we were shut down last week, we're on track. <laughs> Um, we'll, we'll, we'll restart and we'll, and we'll get there. But that's really the function is that somebody, and that somebody's gonna have to be a billionaire, is gonna have to go out there and fly machine learning so many hours and bring this big old hunk of data proving that it works before any regulator will allow it. So it is a, um, it's not a technical problem. It is almost really a, it's almost a kind of a courage and funding problem. And uh, that's why it's gonna take a billionaire or two to do it. Okay, so that's my day job. Um, I also have a, a hobby uh, that um, is somewhat related, which is that, um, so my whole, my whole aviation world started um, with um, drones, and I started a community called DIY Drones, and that turned into a community, you know, a, a, a development community, and that turned into um, something called Drone Code in the Linux Foundation, and that is the core of most drones that aren't Chinese today are running our software. Um, but you know, weirdly, that's a kind of a solved problem. Drones just work, you can buy them in Walmart. Whereas self-driving cars, which you think, would think would be easier, are actually harder for, for two reasons. Um, the, the reason drones are so easy to solve is that, is that actually like staying, like staying in the air, like not falling over was kind of hard and that involves gyros and accelerometers and things like that. But just getting from point A to B, that's just GPS. Um, I made it more complicated with gradient descent, but really it's just, just GPS. Um, but with cars, you, um, first of all, uh, our cars are being raced indoors, so there's no GPS, so we have to use cameras, other sensors. And secondly, you know, with the airplanes, you can be off by a few meters, doesn't matter. With the cars, you gotta stay on the track. Um, so you need much more precision. So we have to do computer vision at high speed with high precision, which is actually something that nobody else is solving. You know, the, the, um, 
you know, the Cruises and the Waymos and the Teslas, et cetera, are largely solving a safety problem, but not solving a speed problem. Um, the history of automotive innovation has always been racing, except for in self-driving cars. So, so we decided that um, much as like DIY drones was about bringing, you know, kind of Raspberry Pi or Arduino like innovation to aviation, this is about being like bringing like Raspberry Pi and um, and cheap cameras and open source machine learning to um, automotive. And it looks like a toy. These are like small vehicles; they're about yay big. They cost under four hundred dollars. And um, we, you know, operated first in things like this, like in warehouses with tracks that are spray painted by my my children. And, um, you know, and, and they're basically the, the, they're designed to be as cheap as possible. They're end-to-end -end neural networks, which is to say that you have a, a camera and a Raspberry Pi and you have a model. And um, typically, the, there's a couple of different methods which I'll get into, but often it was using what's called behavioral cloning, which is basically drive the car around manually around the track, and then the neural network correlates what it, the camera saw with the commands you gave, and then that's your data set, you send it up to the cloud, you, you run through Keras and you end up with a model, and then it just runs the model, um, and so it just runs the inference layer. It doesn't do training on, on board, it does training off board, but it runs the inference later, layer with a Raspberry Pi on board. And, um, and uh, they're, they're very simple, and they work great, um, and we use the stuff you would recognize, TensorFlow, Python, um, and, and, and Raspberry Pi. Um, sometimes we take them and make them a little bit bigger. This is a, um, a go-kart. Um, size of it. This one is, um, that is actually uh, Carl Bass, the former CEO of um, Autodesk, and that uh, he made that car with his, um, with his son. And our main thing was to basically uh, take the steering wheel, put a big old servo on it, and which made that it was impossible for a human to drive it. And now he is a crash test dummy with, with one red button between him and disaster. Um, he was actually actively the CEO of a publicly traded company at this point, and I'm sure that his board would not have been happy had, he, had they known that he wasn't even wearing a helmet. Um, anyway, it, 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 he, he survived. Uh, the car did not, but he did. And, um, and that's about as far as we, as, as we took that size. Um, Amazon decided to, uh, to, to uh, emulate this, and they created something called um, uh, the um, uh, Deep Racer which is using their um, uh, reinforcement learning um, methods, uh, RoboMaker, et cetera. Um, interestingly, it, it's, um, it doesn't work at all. It's, you know, it basically, this whole experience with DeepRacer convinced us that reinforcement learning is a terrible idea in the real world. So the way DeepRacer works is that you have a simulator, you, you know, use reinforcement learning, it, 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 you have, you have you know, um, objective functions, you have, you know, um, you know, cost functions, you've got, you know, goals and penalties and all this kind of stuff. Works great in the simulator. Bring it into the real world, never works. It's like shadows and lighting. And the problem is the, the sim to real gap. That is, um, that the, you know, the real world is always different. The simulator was always the same. The simulator had perfect information. The real world has imperfect information. You can train rapidly in the simulator. It takes forever to train in the real world. So, so that didn't work. Um, this is about as good as it, it got. And um, which is not which is not great, um, and then um, and then we then we decided to use some, some other techniques. This is a nice one. This one is um, this one is uh, here, let me see if I can get this going. Um, uh, this one is, is what's called cone slam, and this is actually looking at these cones on the track and localizing itself based on that. Um, that's a, a particle filter on the top, and it sort of you know, assigns probability. What's interesting is that after Cone Slam worked, we started screwing, the, screwing around with them a little bit, and so we had a small child place a random cone somewhere on the track. The small child is assigned as the random cone generator. Um, and so then the racers got clever enough, so they said, okay, smart guy, we're not gonna look at the cones anymore, now we're gonna look at the lights on the ceiling, which is a, a fingerprint that'll tell you where you are and never moves, and so now it's light slam. And, um, and we don't know how to, how to, how to mess with that because the light's too high to reach. Uh, so, so this is the way that the racers and the track masters uh, you know, compete to make things hard. Um, this is basically just a, a, a comparison of how this looks compared to a traditional um, autonomous car. And basically we try to do everything a Waymo does, but like a lot cheaper. So we have radar, we have LIDAR, we have encoders, we have cameras, um, we have GPS, we have everything they have, except for 
Ours costs, there's a limit of, of $400. And you can actually do a lot with this stuff. Um, you know, I wouldn't get in it, but at one cent scale, it, worked, it works fine. Uh, then, we, um, then we decided to, uh, to really build out the simulator well. And so we took a, a track from, uh, there's a, a company called SparkFun that uh, sells electronics in, in, in Boulder. And they famously had a, tra a race called the Autonomous Vehicle Challenge for, for many years. Anyway, they canceled it, but we've left it, had it live on in simulation. And so, um, and so we built a simulator, and now every month we oscillate between um, virtual races, which are all done in simulation, where the people run their code at home, but that the cars are simulated and the cameras are simulated. And then we do real ones uh, alternating between indoors and outdoors. Um, and you know, then these are a little bit of the, of the, uh, of the different approaches. I, I, mentioned the, I mentioned behavioral cloning and reinforcement learning. Um, sometimes we also use just traditional computer vision. And then outside, we can use GPS and other, and other forms of beacons. And um, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to zip through this one. Um, basically, here's, here's what's going on, that um, uh, deep, learning was, um, deep learning was doing really well, except for the computer vision team. Uh, got ahead, and they got ahead by using the techniques by using localization, by again looking up at the uh, looking at, at the lights or looking down on the on the uh, the cones or using GPS. If you have if you know where you are on the track and where the curves are coming, where the other racers are, you're always going to do better than you, if you don't. So localization always wins, but it's a little cheaty. You know, you need to know something about the track. You need. You need to have some, some sense of where you are. Um, what's interesting is that we blew past, uh, th this, this stops you know, two years ago, we blew past humans. It was incredibly easy to beat humans. The reason being that we actually forced the humans to wear um, first person view goggles and to drive based on the same camera view that the, that the, uh, that the cars had. And it's really hard, because you're like, you know, you're like, you're like right down here. And it's really hard to see the track. And so the humans were, it was not hard to beat the humans. Um, and we're going so fast. We're basically doing scale speeds of 250 miles an hour. Um, I've already talked about the, the, the breakthrough technologies, but basically this is the golden age of this stuff. The computer vision cameras are fantastic. The open source software, the, the Raspberry Pi is perfectly good. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the interfaces, the, um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the servo interfaces and, the, um, uh, the various sensors that are available, everything's awesome. And so, you know, this is the perfect time to be starting this kind of thing. And, um, oh, on your mark. Here we go. Uh, this is, go. and this is an example of uh, two cars now racing head to head in our simulator. Um, these two, this is, uh, we do this, uh, as I mentioned, um, every other month. This is me emceeing it. And um, they're getting pretty good. Uh, at this point, this is a reinforcement learning car versus a, um, uh, behavioral cloning car, and, you st and they're now getting, now they follow the track fine, and now they're getting into the, some actual t tactics. So they get points for going over the hoop, they get over the jump, they get points for going the hoop, they get points for going through the barrels. There's a pedestrian here, oh, which, you, which is, a, is a pedestrian that randomly crosses, etc. And so it's really cool and, um, and free and open, and, and you don't even have to wait for our event. You can just run it, the server locally. Um, and finally, I just wanted to end up at the point, which is that you know, the only real efforts to do this in the big guys are things like Robo, Robo Race, which cost a million dollars and just got killed. Um, the, big, you know, the big guys just don't want to do this because it's these, they're, the big cars cost too much, the crashes are too expensive, it's too embarrassing, and it's just like, it's just a gap there where the only racing is being done at small scale by people like us, and it is crazy that the speed, the aggressive driving side of the equation is being done by a bunch of hobbyists online. And, uh, and you, know, you could say, well, that's irresponsible. And yet, what is the biggest peril with self-driving cars is that they're going to they're gonna slow us down. They're going to be the most conservative drivers on the road. We're already seeing some examples of this. What you want is not, you want safety through nimbleness, not safety through slowness. And so we are like the only people who are exploring truly nimble, what we meaning the community broadly, uh, truly nimble, um, aggressive, safe driving, as opposed to just going slow. So, um, oh, this is not pretty. This is what happened when Robo Race um, started off. This is a million dollar car created by the biggest <laughs> companies in the world. By the way, our cars crash all the time too, but our cars are created by 12 year olds for like, you know, like, like pennies. So, um, so uh, with that, speaking of, of crashes, this, at the end of every race, we have the demolition derby where all cars must race. And it looks like uh, this. Uh, what's cool is you're going to see it hit a, hit, a, hit a boy, 
hit a boy again, a third time. Anyway, it's, it's good fun. Um, and uh, I'll just finish up with the, uh, there's the, uh, the, actually I'll go back one. Oh, I don't have a reverse slide. I guess that's a lesson to me. You cannot go backwards. Um, there, there you go, thank you. Um, there's, you can buy things off the shelf. They're all, they're, they're, they're fun, they're a great way to get started. And this Saturday um, at Circuit Launch in Oakland, um, we're gonna be having a, a race um, in person with a Brazilian barbecue, it's free. Um, and uh, come, come join us, um, all details are here. Thank you very much.